Heavenly Father, we invite your presence in this meeting. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit and angels to be here, that uh, the words spoken would be for your honor and glory and truthful and edifying. We ask that uh, the things that we share are easy to understand and ask for you to help us to understand these things in the proper way, the way that you want us to recognize them, that they will be used by the Holy Spirit to become us, turn us into tools in your hands that we might finish this work and go home soon, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> we, when once Since this morning when we began dealing with this 1843 chart, we've tried to bring a, a defense for the pioneer position of the daily 508, the 1290, the 1335, which is a component of this chart. And of course, to understand the pioneer position on the daily, which is the correct position, then you have to understand this part of the chart, the 10 kingdoms of pagan Rome, three of those kingdoms, the Hurali, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals, were going to be plucked up. Um, in the last presentation, we began to look at this part of the chart, the, the 2,520, which has a direct relationship um, to the 2,300 days, because the, one, the second indignation ends at the identical time, 1844. It was pointed out in, after our last meeting um, that the two passage, passages in Daniel, which are used to confirm the 26, the 2,500 and 20 year time prophecy of Leviticus 26, those two passages being the story of Nebuchadnezzar um, being seven times um, living off the grass as a beast of the field and the story of the fall of Babylon with Belshazzar, those two stories, one is emphasizing in Nebuchadnezzar's story that uh, his kingdom would be restored to him, that uh, once again, the 2520, one of the themes of the 2520 is the breaking of the covenant and the reestablishment of the covenant in 1844 with not literal Israel, but modern Israel. Um, the other 2520 is, is emphasizing the scattering, the treadling, treading down because of the, the desecration of the covenant uh, and the things connected to it, the covenant. And that is emphasized in the story of Belshazzar. And, uh, of course, his kingdom isn't reestablished. He's receiving this message as his kingdom is finished and completed. So you see in those two arguments to support Leviticus 26 that both of them can fall into the two categories that are suggested by these two different time prophecies. But um, we want to take up a, another aspect of Daniel now that is connected with this, and in, on page 93 of your syllabus, syllabus, we start with early writing 74 and 75, and we've read that already a few times in our presentations. We closed with it in our last presentation, so I'm going to pass by that. This is the paragraph where Sister White is emphasizing that the Lord ordained this chart, and she's putting it in the context of the scattering and the gathering, which are the, the, the one 2520 is emphasizing the scattering, the other 2520 is identifying when God gathers his people together. There's no way to separate that understanding out from what Sister White is dealing with in early writing 74. <clears throat> but switching gears a little bit, on page 93, under the, the subtitle of Prophets, it says, The Holy Spirit has so shaped matters both in the giving of the prophecy and in the events portrayed as to teach the, that the human agent is to be kept out of sight hid in Christ, and that the Lord God of heaven and his law are to be exalted. I often use this passage to remind us, as Seventh-day Adventists, that there are at least two primary ways that God conveys information in prophecy. One is that he lays out the prophetic narrative. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. There is prophetic information uh, something's going to happen at a certain time. But another way that the Lord conveys information in prophecy is by the illustrations that the prophet himself is employed to, to do. And, and you'll see one here uh, in just a moment, see a couple of them. But in Education, page 123, it says, Every principle in the Word of God has its place, every fact its bearing, 
and the complete structure in design and execution bears testimony to its author. Such a, such a structure, no mind, but that of the infinite could conceive or fashion. So maybe you haven't personally thought about it too much, but inspiration is clear um, from the first quote that the Holy Spirit has so shaped matters both in the giving of the prophecy and in the events portrayed. The prophetic narrative, that was under the direction of the Holy Spirit. But the giving of the prophecy, how the prophet received the information, what he was doing, where he was, is also a line of truth that we need to understand. And every fact in God's word has its place and its bearing. So you'll see at the bottom of page 93, you'll see a, a, a familiar passage to Seventh-day Adventists, Isaiah 6, 1 through 10. Um, You'll notice, let, let's read it. I don't think we need to read it all, but um, let's start in the very beginning. In the year that King Uzziah died, I also, the Lord, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. You don't have the word vision in here, but upon the testimony of two, a thing can be established, and you can go through and look at Ezekiel and Daniel and other passages in the Bible where the prophets are seeing the glory of the Lord in the temple and they will identify that they see this vision of the Lord in the temple and the word that they use that is translated vision is mare. It's this snapshot vision that Daniel identifies as the vision he's seen on October 22nd, 1844. The 2300-year vision is the mare vision and here, although Isaiah does not say vision, he is seeing the Lord in his temple. Isaiah is seeing the Mare vision. And it goes on. And it stood, this, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, and he said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, this is Isaiah, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Isaiah is, sees the Lord in his holy temple and realizes that he's an, a corrupt human being and an angel comes and purifies him with a coal from the altar. And that's all interesting, but there is a truth there that we need to understand because that isn't Isaiah there. It is, it is Isaiah in one sense, but Isaiah as a prophet here is symbolizing you and I. Next page, Testimonies, Volume 7, 154. I call the attention to all our workers, to the sixth chapter of Isaiah. Read the experience of God's prophet when he saw Isaiah 6, 1 through 8 quoted. This is the experience needed by those who labor in all our institutions. Everyone in Adventism needs to have a vision, a personal and real vision of Christ in the most holy place that humbles us in the dust and allows Christ to touch our lips with the coal from the altar to purify us that we might take the message to the world. That's, uh, Isaiah here is a, a symbol of God's people during the Day of Atonement time period. And over and over again, prophets are used in this way. This is standard understanding in Adventism. When John in Revelation 10 takes the book of Daniel and eat it, eats it in its sweet in his mouth and bitter in his stomach, we know that he's representing the Millerite time period. He's representing God's people at the end of the world. Over and over again, prophets represent God's people at the end of the world. Look at Zechariah chapter 4. Now Zechariah, remind yourself, Zechariah is a prophet during the time period that they're re rebuilding the temple after they've come out of Babylon. Therefore, a prophet during that time period when they're rebuilding the temple, is going to be familiar with the furnishing of the temple, correct? <laughs> Even the lay people during that work were going to understand the furnishing, let alone a prophet. 
So in chapter 4 it says, And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me. as a man that is wakened out of the sleep. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are on, upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl, and the other on the left side thereof. So I answered, and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Do you know what they are? Do, do we know what the seven a branched candlestick is? What's the seven branched candlestick? This is the candlestick in the holy place, right? Every seventh day Adventists know that. Why is it that Zechariah, a, the prophet, doesn't know it in the very time that they're rebuilding the temple? Why doesn't he know it? Are we sure he doesn't know it? So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, no, my Lord. It emphasizes the fact that Zechariah here does not know anything about this furnishing in the sanctuary. And who is Zechariah here? Well, he's a people that, that this passage, the first thing it tells us in this passage is Zechariah here is representing a people at the end of the world because the, the prophets are illustrating God's people at the end of the world. That's what, what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now, all these things happen as an example is the end of the world. So who is the people at the end of the world that were sleeping and they woke up and realized they did not know what the sanctuary was? The Millerites. Here Zechariah is representing the Millerites. October 23rd, 1844, they've been awakened by the midnight cry in the parable of the ten virgins and they look around and they do not understand the sanctuary. And that's why in Revelation 10 John and 11, John is told, go measure the temple. You need to become familiar as Seventh-day Adventists with the temple. Zechariah is just dealing with one part of the history of God's people at the end of the world here, and it continues on. It says, Then he answered and spake unto me, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, say the Lord of hosts. In Revelation 9, or in Revelation 10, 9 through 11, 1, we see John, and we're familiar with this, also illustrating God's people at the end of the world. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And we know what that is, what John is representing there. This isn't prophetic events. This is an illustration of truth. John's representing the Millerite time period. And then he's told, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. That's what the Millerites had to do. They had to come to grips with what the sanctuary really was because they thought it had been the earth. They had to measure the temple and the altar in them that worship therein. So the point that I'm making here is that prophets are used to illustrate God's people at the end of the world. Um, and there are several to turn to, to, but upon the testimony of two, things shall be established. So we gave you three, Isaiah, um, Zechariah, and John. So when you come to... Daniel chapter 10, verse 1, I'm suggesting that in Daniel 10, verse 1, that Daniel, among other things, is representing God's people here at the end of the world, and I want to share with you why I believe this. Um, in, in an earlier presentation, we prepared, hopefully prepared a little bit of the way for this. You'll see in your notes on the page 94, bottom of the page, that you have verse 1, and Daniel 9.23 together there. Let's start with 9.23. Daniel 9.23 is when Gabriel is coming to Daniel to give him an explanation of the time prophecy of the 2300 years that he received in Daniel chapter 8. And in verse 23 it says, Gabriel says this to Daniel, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth and I am come to show thee, thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter, and consider the vision. The vision here is the Mare vision. It's the snapshot vision. It's the, the vision of Christ in the most holy place on October 22nd, 1844. And I know if some of you came in and, did, and weren't 
present in that presentation on the vision. There are two visions in the book of Daniel. One means the complete vision, the vision that begins in the time periods of the Medes and the Persians in Daniel 8 and describes the trampling down of God's people from the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks, pagan Rome, and papal Rome. This is the question of Daniel 8, 13. How long shall be the complete vision concerning paganism and papalism trampling down the sanctuary and its host. There's a, a vision in the book of Daniel that deals with duration. The question of verse 13 is how long. It's talking about duration. The question isn't when. If the question was when, it would be about a point in time. But verse 13 is how long is this vision? And in the book of Daniel, there's two visions. One has to do with duration and the, the subject of this long period of time is the trampling down of God's people. And the other vision that you can isolate, it's a different Hebrew word in the book of Daniel, has to do with when Daniel saw Christ in the most holy place on October 22nd, 1844. And it overwhelmed Daniel. Daniel. Daniel knew who Christ was. Earlier in the book, Daniel had already interacted with Christ. He knew who he was, and suddenly he sees Christ, not just as Christ, but as the great high priest on the Day of Atonement in the most holy place in, in Daniel 8, he identifies he's overwhelmed. This just amazes him. He knew Christ was the lion of the tribe of Judah, I suppose, I assume. And he knew that the tribe of Judah was not to be the high priest. So, I mean, there's a lot of reasons that Daniel was blown away when he's seen Christ in the most holy place, and that's a different vision. That's the Mare vision. And when you go through these two visions in the book of Daniel, you'll see that one of the things, that, one of the characteristics of the Chao Zone vision, the vision of duration, is that it's long. It's long. And in verse 23, when Gabriel comes to Daniel, it says, Therefore, understand the matter and consider the snapshot, the Mare vision. And I'm suggesting to you that this matter is just another identification of the Chao Zone duration vision. Why do I say that? Because here is where Gabriel says, understand the vision of the treading down. And he, he gives the, the historical breakdown of the 2300 years, which is the Chazon vision. He tells the components of that time period. It doesn't say there, understand the Mare. It says, consider the Mare and understand the matter. And... I suggest to you that the only way you can really understand this trampling down is if you have a good understanding of what takes place on October 22nd, 1844. And that's what's being told us here. But when you go to Daniel 10, verse 1, it says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing, this word thing is debar. It's the same word as verse 23 that is translated as matter. Debar, in verse 23, it says, Understand the debar, understand the matter. But here in Daniel 10, 1, it's saying, a Debar, a thing was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, and the Debar, the thing, was true. But the time appointed was long, and he understood the Debar. If he used the words of verse 23, it would say, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a matter was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belshazzar, and the matter was true, and the time appointed was long. And he understood the matter and had understanding of the vision. And my point is, is this matter, this Debar, is one of the characteristics of it is it's a long period of time and is when you look at one of the characteristics of the child's own vision, we're told that it is a long period of time. And in Daniel 10, 1, Daniel is representing God's people at the end of the world that understand both visions. Because when it says, and had understanding of the vision in verse 1, that's the mare. In verse 1 of Daniel 10, he has understanding of the Debar, the Chao Zone vision, and he has understanding of the Mare. And the God's people at the end of the world that have understanding both of the vision of the, the trampling down by the paganism and papalism, the Millerites had that. They understood that. But the Millerites did not understand Christ in the most holy place. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't understand the sanctuary. They thought it was the earth. Daniel is here representing the people that understand both visions. They understand the, the vision of the papacy, and they understand the work of Christ in the most holy place. Daniel here is being used to illustrate the 144,000. And you can, you can take the components of this passage and uh, nail that down very uh, clearly. You have uh, verses 2 through 11 in your um, notes. 
And uh, let's, let's read down this and, and see how simple this is to see. Once you see that prophets are used to illustrate God's people at the end of the world, then your, your next task as a student of prophecy is, okay, at what point in time are these prophets illustrating God's people at the end of the world? Are they, as Zechariah, are they God's people at the end of the world that wake up in the parable of the ten virgins and do not understand what the furnishings in the sanctuaries are? Because if that's God's people at the end of the world, that's the Millerites immediately after October 22nd, 1844. They woke up in the parable of the ten virgins but did not understand the sanctuary. Or, as a prophet illustrates God's people at the end of the world, is he illustrating the 144,000? The work of a student of prophecy when we see a prophet illustrating God's people at the end of the world is to try to figure out just, just who and where is he illustrating God's people at the end of the world. So I'm suggesting this is the 144,000. Look at verse 2. In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Brothers and sisters... When is it that God's people are called to a fast? The Day of Atonement. Daniel's representing here people that have been called to a fast, the Day of Atonement. And in the first, in the four and twentieth day of the first month, I was by the side of the great river, which is Hittical. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. His body was also like beryl, and his face as the appearance. By the way, this word appearance in the Hebrew is mare. This is the word that so often in the book of Daniel and the Bible is translated as vision. That means snapshot vision. Sometimes it's translated as appearance. This is mare. Daniel has this mare appearance, which is emphasizing October 22nd, 1844, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like the color to polish brass, and his voice, words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. This is Mare vision. This is the word translated vision in Daniel 8 that the Hebrew allows you to very conclusively show that this is the vision of October 22nd, 1844. We did that in earlier presentations. Daniel here, he's seen Christ on October 22nd, 1844. He, not necessarily on that date, but he's seen Christ in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. That's what he's representing. People that have a personal experience and confrontation with Jesus Christ in the most holy place. He says, I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision. Same word, vision, Mari. Now, brothers and sisters, Seventh-day Adventists have been called into the most holy place experience with Jesus Christ. But you and I know from the prophetic testimony and from the fact that we live in the culture of Adventism is everyone in Adventism entering into the work of entering into the most holy place in that experience. Are they? Do they? See, there's two groups in Adventism. And that's what Daniel is symbolizing here. Verse 7. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision. But a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Isn't that what prophetic testimony says? There's going to be a shaking. And those people, and Sister White specifically says this, those people among us that refuse to enter into the work of sanctification will be shaken out from among us. And here's Daniel at a time period where he's illustrating God's people at the end of the world having a personal confrontation with Jesus Christ in the most holy place in the time period of the fasting, the Day of Atonement. And he's with a group of people, but they flee from him. Why? Because they don't see the vision. That's what it says. Not what I say. That's what they said here. Verse 8, therefore I was left alone. And, and, and you know something? More than once, you know what Sister White says? There's, there's a passage in Testimonies 5 where she says this two times in the one passage alone using this expression. And it, it just, it's a solemn expression in my mind. She says, if the Lord has ever spoken by me. Boy, when she qualifies it like that, that's, that's pretty strong qualification. Then you know what she says? If the Lord has ever spoken by me, the time will come when we will stand alone. That's a promise. It's a promise. And verse 8 says of Daniel, Therefore I was left alone. When was he left alone? Immediately after the shaking that separated those people that would not enter into the most holy place experience from those that would, that are being symbolized 
by Daniel here in chapter 10. God's people at the end of the world. I was left alone, and I saw this great vision. That's Mare vision. And there remained no strength in me at all. Brothers and sisters, when you and I finally wake up to the fact that if we don't prepare our character for the seal of God, we're about ready to see the mark of the beast, when we are finally woken up to that fact, if we choose by faith to enter into the most holy place experience with Christ, to put away our sins, you know what happens? Just like Isaiah. We're going to fall down crumbled into dust saying, I am a man of unclean lips. I'm totally corrupt. I can't stand here. And that's what happens to Daniel. He says, therefore, I was left alone. I saw this great vision and there remained no human strength in me at all. I can't save myself. I'm lost. That's what Daniel's representing here. For my comeliness was turned in me into corruption and I retained no strength. We must come to the foot of the cross and allow the Lord to remove all this human self-dependency from us in order that he may pick us up. And of course, that's what happens in verse 9. It says, yet I heard the, wor- the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then I was in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground, and behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. Brothers and sisters, we need to come in the most holy place and be changed to where we can hear the voice of the Lord. And he said unto me, verse 11, O Daniel, a grand man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee I am now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Daniel is representing the 144,000 at the end of the world. And if you go back up to verse 1, the first thing he tells us about the 144,000 at the end of the world is that they under, he understood the, the bar, the Chow Zone vision, that vision of the trampling down, and he understood the Mare vision. He understood both. He understood the story of the papacy, and he understood the experience necessary that is attained by entering into the most holy place. This is the 144,000, and I'm emphasizing that for this reason. Many times where you're sharing prophecy, people come to you many times and say, you have a lot to say about the events connected with the close of probation, but when is it that uh, you emphasize the most important part, and that's to have an experience prepared for the seal of God? And I understand that logic, and I agree with that logic. If you had to pick between one or, one or the other, if you had to pick from a human perspective, do I want to know all the events connected that show that probation's about to close? Do I want to know what all the, those things are going to happen? Or do I want to have a character prepared for the seal of God? But human reasoning says you want the character, even if you don't know the events. But the reality of inspiration says the 144,000 have both. And if it says they have both, it means we must have both. And the other reality of it is is that Laodiceans are so asleep that the Lord has specifically identified how Laodiceans are awakened. This isn't in the notes, but let's look at it. Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. How is it that Laodiceans are awakened? Verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out into the spirit carried me in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley which was full of bones. This is Ezekiel, and Ezekiel is representing God's people at the end of the world here. This story is, and caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. Ezekiel's taken to a place where he sees a valley of dry bones, and if you have an Ellen White study Bible, you can look at the comments down below, which is very clear who this valley of dry bones are. You know who they are? It's the Seventh-day Adventist church at the end of the world, according to inspiration. And verse 3 says, the Lord, and he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, prophesy unto these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And brothers and sisters, if you watch this narrative unfold, Ezekiel is told how many times to prophesy to these bones? Seven times. The the Seventh-day Adventist church in this passage is portrayed as being so dead that they're not wet bones with some flesh on them. The flesh is long gone. There's no moisture in these bones. They're so dead that it's impossible to think they're going to come back to life. And the Lord says the way they're brought back to life is through prophecy. 
And in verse 10, it says, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into me, and I, they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And Sister White says that this is the Seventh-day Adventist church getting raised to life. This is the latter rain, loud cry time period. And, and, and the passage continues on, brothers and sisters. Look at verse 15, which is, which is just a, a secondary overview of this, this story. Notice verse 14 before we get there. He says, I shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live. But notice verse 15. It says, The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick. Take a stick. Okay? And write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions, and take another stick and write upon it for Joseph and the stick of Ephraim and for all the house of Israel, his companions. We've got two sticks here. What are the sticks? Huh? Sticks, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Okay. And join them to one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. When do they get joined together in one stick? 1844. 1844 is when they get joined together into one stick. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and I will put, with, put them with him, even the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine land. This is October 22nd, 1844. God is raising up his covenant people once again in one group, not two tribes, not a northern and southern kingdom, just modern Israel, the Seventh-day Adventist church. And the sticks whereupon thou writest shall be in thine hand before thine eyes, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they have gone, they've been scattered, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. That's the Seventh-day Adventist church. And one king shall be king to them all, and they shall, no more, they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and I will cleanse them, so shall they be my people, I will be their God. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd, and they shall also walk in my judgments, and observe my statutes, and do them, and they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein you fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. He's reestablishing the covenant on October 22nd, 1844 with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. At the end of these two time prophecies of indignation. And he says, it shall be an everlasting covenant and I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them, yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Brothers and sisters, the Lord is going to raise up modern Israel, and he's going to do it in the Seventh-day Adventist church, and the way that he brings these dead bones back to life is through prophecy. We need to stand in the most holy place, experience with a character prepared for the seal of God, but the reality of it is God's people at the end of the world are dead, and inspiration says the way that we are brought back to life is through prophecy. So if you have to choose between the events of prophecy or the experience, you, you probably want the experience, but the reality of it is in our condition as dead, dry bones, we do not get awakened unless we get confronted with the events that demonstrate probation's about to close. We have to have them both. And in Daniel 10, 1, Daniel understands both things. He understands them both. Page 95. Center of the page, events which we must know. All that God has in prophetic history specified to be fulfilled in the past has been. And all that is yet to come in its order will be. Daniel, God's prophet, stands in his place. John stands in his place. 
In the Revelation, the Lion of the tribe of Judah has opened to the students of prophecy the book of Daniel, and thus Daniel is standing in his place. He bears his testimony, that which the Lord revealed to him in vision of the great and solemn events which we may or may not need to know. We must know as we stand on the very threshold of their fulfillment. Brothers and sisters, we have to understand the child's own vision. We have to be able to clearly identify who the United States, the United Nations, Islam, and the Pope of Rome is at this point in history. And the only way to intelligently do that is if you understand the foundations of Adventism as illustrated upon this chart. This is, this is where it's at. The fast, you can see the fast, Leviticus 16, 29 through 31, that you and I have been called to. And this is the fast that Daniel's representing, the Day of Atonement. The quaking that shakes out the, the men that were with Daniel. Great Controversy 608, as the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth abandon their positions and they leave Daniel standing alone. Daniel symbolizing the 144,000. Notice this next passage, page 96 on the top. She's quoting from, from Daniel 10, where Daniel's had his personal confrontation with Christ. You notice the first word saying, When he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face towards the ground, and I became dumb. That's there, there in Daniel 10. But drop down to where she's, the next paragraph. She says, Daniel was a devoted servant of the Most High. His, life, his long life was filled up with noble deeds of service for his master. His purity of character and unwavering fidelity are equaled only by his humil humility of heart and his contrition, contrition before God. We repeat, she's already said this once earlier in this passage, but it's too long to put in here. We repeat, the life of Daniel is an inspired illustration of true sanctification. Daniel's life illustrates 144,000. We're plainly told so. Because 144,000 are those men and women that are experiencing, will experience true sanctification. So the question is, Daniel heard his voice. Have you heard his voice? Have I heard his voice? Never attempt to search the scriptures unless you are ready to listen. Unless you are ready to be a learner, unless you are ready to listen to the word of God as though his voice were speaking directly to you from the living oracles. If we're not ready to do that, we shouldn't open the Bible. Never let mortal man set in judgment upon the word of God or pass sentence on how much of this is inspired and how much is not inspired or that this is more inspired than some other sources. God warns him off that ground. God has not given him any such work to do. There isn't anything in there that isn't inspired, and that includes the writings of Ellen White. We want to keep close to the truth for, that is for the, our times, present truth. We want to know what is truth now. We claim to believe the third angel's message. We claim that the angel was flying through the midst of heaven, proclaiming the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This was the proclamation. Did you hear his voice? Did he speak so you could hear that message? Did, you, did the world hear it? Did the world hear any note? Did they want to hear? Will anyone hear it? Yes, those who've been walking out step by step as Jesus leads the way. And when the position of Christ changed from the holy to the most holy place in the sanctuary, it is by faith to enter with him, understand his work, and then pre to present to the world the last message of mercy that is to be given to the world. What is she saying? She's saying, if you and I are going to hear his voice, we must be right where Daniel was, and that's crumbled in the ground in the most holy place having an experience with Jesus Christ. That's where we're going to hear his voice. And what is it? It is a message to prepare a people for the second coming of the Son of Man. It is a great day of God's preparation, and therefore every minister of Jesus Christ should have in his course of action, in the burden of his labor, a zeal and a living interest and intensity in his efforts, which is appropriate to the truth that is for this time, which is claimed to be the last message of mercy to our world. Well then, we cannot sleep. We cannot be indifferent. We must labor for precious souls around us of men and women. We must be working with all our might, for the Lord is coming. Great controversy. In Daniel 10, he gets lifted up and stands upon his feet, and in great controversy, she talks about who's going to be able to prepare to stand. Only the people that enter into the most holy place experience are going to stand during that time. So, 
I submit to you that in the beginning of Daniel's last vision, and Daniel's last vision is 10, 11, and 12, that Daniel represents 144,000. But go back to Daniel 12, verse 4. And you have these verses on page 97, but if you're in your Bible or the notes, verse 4 says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And the one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard a man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand unto heaven and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. As a seventh-day Adventist, what's the time, times, and a half represent? 1260 years of papal persecution. Verse 8, Daniel says, And I heard, but I understood not. There's a contradiction in the Bible for you. Daniel's last vision is chapter 10, 11, and 12. Same vision. Nobody, nobody argues that it's not the same vision. And in verse 1 of Daniel 10, the very first thing that we're told about Daniel is he had understanding of the thing and he had understanding of the vision. And here we are in chapter 12, verse 8, and Daniel hears these things and he don't understand. And I heard, but I understood not. How is it that he understands everything in verse 1 of chapter 10 and when you get to the end of the vision, he says, I don't understand. It's because he's representing God's people at the end of the world. Was there, was there ever a time when God's people at the end of the world did not know what the 1260 years of papal persecution was? Yeah, the Millerites. The Millerites didn't understand that. They had a burden to understand it. It says, verse 8 says, And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Daniel wants to understand them, but he doesn't. The Millerites wanted to understand the book of Daniel, but they didn't. But God began to unseal the book of Daniel. And verse 9 says, And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thy way, Daniel, till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in the lot at the end of the days. Brothers and sisters, in Daniel 12, Daniel is placed in between the 1,260-year time prophecy and the 1,290 and the 1,335-year time prophecy. In the, the grammatic structure, he's in between the 1,260 and the 1,290, 1,335. And he's portrayed as a people that do not understand these things. And I'm suggesting to you here that Daniel here is representing the Millerites. They come to the end of the world. God is, it's the time of the end. And that's what the whole context of Daniel 12 is. It's at the time of the end. Um, there's going to be an increase of knowledge that prepares the people to stand. There's going to be an increase of knowledge, and the Millerites were the people that understood the increase of knowledge. And what was the increase of knowledge that the Millerites understood? It's represented on this chart. I mean, this is easy to see. There's the 1290, the 1335. There's the 1260. The very things that Daniel doesn't understand in Daniel 12, the Millerites didn't understand until the Lord started unsealing the book of Daniel. The, Daniel wanted to understand he asked, what, what, what do these things mean? The Millerites wanted to understand these things, and the Lord blessed. And they did understand these things, and they, they took them to the world. But you know what? He's also representing you and I at the end of the world. Because you and I at the end of the world, we understand the, the 1260, the 1290, and the 1335, although there's a lot of wrong ideas in Adventism about those prophecies too, but we have all the books available to keep us straight on those. But what we don't understand, possibly, is the theoretical truth connected with those things. Because if you look back at verse 7, it says, And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever that shall be for a time, times and a half, Here's the 1260, but what is the 1260? What's the context of the 1260 here in verse 7? It says, And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people. There's seven places in inspiration for the 1260 years of papal rule are specifically identified. And here in verse 7 of Daniel 12, this 1260 years, it's 
emphasizing that it's a time period of the scattering. See, we understand the time prophecy part of it is God's people at the end of the world, but we don't understand the scattering at the end of the world that is illustrated in the 2520, and at the end of the world, God's people are going to understand that. Now, Daniel also has two other time prophecies in Daniel 12 that come in a moment, the 1290 and the 1335. And you know what the 1335 does? It takes you right down here to 1843 and 1844 when the call goes, come to the marriage. Those are the two themes, these time prophecies that Daniel's standing in the middle of that he doesn't understand. He represents the Millerites that didn't understand the time component of those time prophecies, but there was an increase of knowledge, and they came to understand them, and they portrayed them on this chart. And at the end of the world, God's people, once again, are going to be confronted with the theoretic truths connected with these time prophecies, and they need to come to understand the theoretic component of these time prophecies that are illustrated in the 2520 that tell what the scattering of God's people is about and what the gathering of God's people is about. So, remember, every fact has its bearing. If you break these up, and you're, I'm on page 98, and I know this has to be a little bit uh, busy, the scattering, the daily, the abomination that maketh desolate, and the blessing are the themes that are in the 1260, the 1290, and the 1335 in Daniel 12. The time component of these prophecies was correctly understood by the Millerites in their day and age when there was an increase of knowledge on the time component of these time prophecies. But the Millerite time period is repeated again to the very letter at the end of the world. And once again, God's people are going to see light connected with these prophecies, but not the time component, the, the theoretical component. One of them's emphasizing the scattering, the trampling down. One of them's em emphasizing the gathering, the reinstatement of a covenant with a covenant people. So the scattering, if you're in the middle of the page 98, the scattering is associated with God's first indignation that ended in 1798. It's associated with the daily and the papacy, 508, 538, 1798, the powers that did the trampling down, paganism and papalism. The blessing, the wedding, 1843, 1844, has to do with God's second indignation against Judah. The curse is the scattering, the daily, the abomination. The blessing is the second indignation. There are also the vision of the Hittical and the vision of the Uli, and we went through those. They're the Chow's own vision and the Mare vision. Brothers and sisters, I'm submitting to you in, in this component of the 1843 chart, and it's on these notes, and I don't think I'm going to read this final quote because we've read it at least three times so far. How much time do we have? Let's, let's put it in record one more time. I ah, know, we've read it. Early writings, page 74. Brothers and sisters, when, when Sister White is referring to this chart and saying that it was directed by the hand of the Lord, she does it in the context of the scattering and the gathering. She says, don't, don't change any figures on here. They're just as God wants them. She says, there were some mistakes, and we know the mistakes was the year zero. But... Her information in other places, not in early writing, tell us that the production of this chart was brought about from two passages in Scripture, Habakkuk, Habakkuk 2 and Ezekiel 12, which had to do with a burden that was placed upon God's people to clarify the truths of the foundations of Adventism. And that understanding came to the Millerite movement in 18, just after 1842, right in the middle of that time period that we're, we're walking through the repetition of today. And therefore, as we repeat that history, it's reasonable to suggest that the, the, the foundational truths that are on this chart will have an impact on our understanding at the end of the world. There's going to be a, a connection, and that when we begin to understand these things, when the hand of the Lord is removed from these things, that we will be paralleling the experience of the Millerites. And part of the experience of the Millerites is that they had a burden to understand the 1260, the 1290, and the 1335. And sure enough, the Lord answered that for them. He told them what those time prophecies were all about.
But as we repeat that history at the end of the world, we're not going to have the burden to understand the time elephant because we already know that. Our burden will understand what do those time prophecies mean theoretically. And what they mean is that in order to correctly put prophecy at, together at the end of the world, we must see the relationship between the scattering and the gathering as represented in these two time prophecies of 2520 on the northern and southern kingdom. And one of the strongest arguments that this is correct is the fact that when Sister White is endorsing this chart, that's exactly the reference, the context that she's putting it in. The Lord showed me that he has stretched out his hand a second time to recover the remnant of his people and that efforts must be redoubled in this gathering time, in the scattering. This is the gathering time. This is the scattering time prior to it. She's talking about these two time prophecies. After she emphasizes this, in the same paragraph, she says, I saw that this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord. And brothers and sisters, the Millerites didn't understand this correctly. Hiram Edson came along. He didn't understand it correctly. But they did both understand it correctly. They were correct, but they were incorrect. God has held his hand over this until now. Now we can see that Edson was right and Miller was right. And we can see the, the connection that these two prophecies make with all the other prophecies in Daniel and Revelation. And suddenly we realize that the Lord is removing his hand from this chart. Now, brothers and sisters, turn with me in closing real quick, please. Revelation 10, verse 4. Let's remind us, remind ourselves of something. In Daniel 12, the book of Daniel, we're told in Daniel 12 is unsealed and there's an increase of knowledge and the increase of knowledge to the Millerites in the time of the end was an understanding of the time prophecies, the time element of these prophecies. And in Revelation 10, did I tell you to turn to Daniel 10? No. Revelation 10, verse 4. It says, and when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. The seven thunders were sealed up. The book of Daniel was sealed up for the Millerites, and it was unsealed for the Millerites, and there was an increase of knowledge on the time prophecies as represented on this chart. But in the book of Revelation, verse 4, the seven thunders are sealed up. And if you have an Ellen White study Bible, you see that Sister White says the seven thunders represent the history of 1840 to 44. And then in another place, she says it represents future events that will be disclosed in their order. What was sealed up in the book of Revelation is an understanding of the history of the Millerite time period and that that history would be repeated. It was sealed up. And then in Revelation 22, verse 10, it says, And he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. The book of Revelation says that there's a prophecy in Revelation that just before human probation closes is unsealed. And the only prophecy in Revelation that's been sealed up is verse 4 of Revelation 10, the seven thunders. And Sister White says the seven thunders represent the history of the Millerites and a history at the end of the world that repeats the history of the Millerites. And in the Millerite time period, this is an expression of their understanding. We should expect fully that as we get close to the close of probation, light should shine from these foundational truths and we're sharing that light here brothers and sisters the vision does not prolong any longer that's what Ezekiel 12 says and the vision for us is that a Sunday law is about to take place in the United States and God is about to purify his people and those of us in the United States that have not prepared a character for the seal of God by entering into the most holy place experience as illustrated in Daniel 10 are going to receive the mark of the beast if we don't get laid to rest before that time period. But the vision is no longer prolonged. When you reach the point in the repetition of history, when the truths established upon these chart begin to shine for God's people at the end of the world. Shall we pray?
Heavenly Father, we want to be among those people that Daniel was representing in chapter 10. Not among those people that fled from the, the shaking, but among those people that Daniel was representing. We want to be among those that have a personal experience, a personal revelation of you in the most holy place. We want to be among those people that you lift up as we recognize and acknowledge that our human strength is worthless and crumble into the dust. We want to be lifted up by you and let the, the coals from the altar be placed in our lips that we might perfectly reflect your character to a dying world and be a tool in your hand to finish this work. Lord, we have friends and family members that are not awake to these things and we want them to hear this message and come alive and uh, we need to be perfect vessels in order to do that, perfect in you. We ask that you make this happen and prepare the way for those around us that we are required to witness to, that we can be effective and powerful in finishing this work. We thank you for your prophetic message that awakens us to our need of the experience that the world needs. The world needs to see this experience. Seventh-day Adventists need to be awakened to the events that demonstrate this experience is an absolute requirement at this time in the earth's history. Awaken us to this, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.